could not have been issued under Article 356, there would be no material relief which can be given in view of the fact that President's rule was revoked in the state of Jammu and Kashmir on 31st October 2019. Further, the petitioners have assailed the specific actions which were taken when the proclamation was in force on the ground that those actions breached the constitutional limitations on the exercise of power after the proclamation under Article 356 was issued. These substantive challenges which form the fulcrum of the case of the petitioners have been considered. Next issue, whether there are limitations on the exercise of power by the President or Parliament under Article 356. We have held that there are limitations on the power which can be exercised by the Union government in the state when a proclamation under Article 356 is in operation. We have reached the conclusion on the following grounds. A. The majority in SR Bommai, the nine-judge bench decision, held that the actions taken by the President after issuing a proclamation are subject to judicial review. However, the learned judges adopted slight variations on the standard needed to be applied by the court to test the validity of the exercise of power by the President after the issuance of the proclamation. Justice Sawant applied the standard of whether the exercise of power was malafide or palpably irrational. Justice Reddy observed that the advisability and necessity of the action must be borne in mind by the President. 2. This bench sitting in a combination of five judges is bound by the decision of the majority in SR Bommai on the issue. We also undertook a textual and purposive reading of Article 356 in particular and Part 18 as a whole. We hold that there are limitations on the power exercisable after a proclamation under Article 356 is issued. The following are our reasons. First, the thread that runs through Part 18 of the Constitution, when read as a whole, is that differing levels of executive and legislative power are required to handle an emergency under Article 352 and under Article 356. This principle applies to the exercise of power when a proclamation under Article 356 is in force. Second, Article 356.1 states that the President may, by a proclamation, assume or declare the powers stipulated in clauses A, B, and C of Article 356.1. The powers stipulated in clauses A, B, and C of Article 356.1 are not automatically invoked when a proclamation is issued under Article 356. Third, Article 356.1a does not opt for an all or none formula. The phrase all or any does not indicate that the union government can exercise a part of the functions of the state government and the state government can exercise the remaining because the suspension of the state government is an automatic consequence of the proclamation under Article 356. It rather indicates that the scope of the power exercised by the union government must depend on the circumstances for issuing the proclamation. Fourth, clauses A, B and C of Article 356.1 grant the President independent powers. However, the power provided under Clause C is broad enough to encapsulate the power of the President to assume functions under Clause A and declare under Clause B that the powers of the legislature of the state shall be exercisable by Parliament. Fifth, the principle underlying Article 356.1c is that the exercise of power by the President must be desirable or necessary to give effect to the objects of the proclamation. The commonality in both the necessity and desirability standard is that the exercise of power must have a reasonable nexus with the object of the proclamation. Thus, the principle which runs through Article 356.1c and which also guides the exercise of power under Article 356.1a is that the exercise of power must have a reasonable nexus with the object of the proclamation. And sixth, when a proclamation under Article 356 is in force, there are innumerable decisions which are taken by the Union Government on behalf of the State Government for the purpose of day-to-day -day administration. Every decision and action taken by the Union Executive on behalf of the State is not subject to challenge. Opening up challenge to every decision would lead to chaos and uncertainty. It would in effect put the administration in the State at a standstill. Therefore, the following standard is laid down to assess actions under Article 356 after the proclamation has been issued. A. The exercise of power by the President under Article 356 must have a reasonable nexus to the object of the proclamation. B. The person challenging the exercise of power must prima facie establish 
that it is a malafide or extraneous exercise of power. After a prima facie case is made, the owner shifts to the union to justify that the exercise of power had a reasonable nexus with the object of the proclamation. And C, the exercise of power by the president for everyday administration of the state is not ordinarily subject to judicial review. The argument of the petitioners that the union government cannot take actions which have irreversible consequences when a proclamation under Article 356 is in force is not accepted. The power of the legislature of the state under Article 357 to repeal or alter or amend a law enacted by parliament in exercise of the power of the legislature of the state must be read in the context of the amendment introduced by the Constitution 42nd Amendment Act 1976. Before the amendment, the law to the extent of incompetency would automatically cease to exist after a buffer period and actions done were expressly saved. However, an express repeal by the competent legislature is required for the law to cease to exist after the amendment. The repealing statute would in such case make provisions for actions taken during the subsistence of the legislation. The observations in Krishna Kumar Singh on whether the consequence of an ordinance can subsist even after the ordinance ceases to exist cannot be transposed to interpret the limits of Article 356 because an ordinance which has the effect of a law by its very nature has a limited life. The argument of the petitioners that Parliament can only assume the, assume the law-making powers of the legislature of the state when the proclamation under Article 356 is issued is not accepted. The purpose of Article 357 is to ensure that while exercising the powers of the legislature of the state, pursuant to a declaration under Article 356.1, Parliament, or as the case may be, the President, are not impeded by an absence of competence which would have impeded the exercise of a similar power in the absence of a proclamation under Article 356. Further, Article 357 does not contain a non obstante provision which overrides Article 356. To interpret Article 357.1 as a restriction on Article 356.1b would be to read in a restriction which the plain terms of the Constitution do not provide. As held above, the exercise of power after a proclamation under Article 356 is issued is subject to judicial review and immunity from judicial scrutiny does not attach to the exercise of constitutional powers of the legislature of the state. The court, while judicially reviewing the exercise of power, can determine if the exercise of the constitutional power of the legislature of the state by parliament has a reasonable nexus with the object sought to be achieved by the proclamation. The next issue is whether Jammu and Kashmir retained an element of sovereignty or internal sovereignty when it joined the Union of India. We have held that the state of Jammu and Kashmir did not retain an element of sovereignty when it joined the Union of India. We have arrived at this conclusion for the following reasons. First, paragraph 8 of the instrument of accession executed by Maharaja Hari Singh provided that nothing in the instrument would affect the continuance of the sovereignty of the Maharaja in and over the state. Second, on 25 November 1949, a proclamation was issued for the state of Jammu and Kashmir by Yuvraj Karan Singh. The declaration in this proclamation that the constitution of India would not only supersede all other constitutional provisions in the state, which were inconsistent with it, but also abrogate them, achieves what would have been attained by an agreement of merger. With the issuance of the proclamation, paragraph 8 of the instrument of accession ceased to be of legal consequence. The proclamation reflects the full and final surrender of sovereignty by Jammu and Kashmir through its sovereign ruler to India, to her people who are sovereign. Third, neither the constitutional setup nor any other factors indicate that the state of Jammu and Kashmir retained an element of sovereignty. The constitution of Jammu and Kashmir was only to further define the relationship between the Union of India and the state of Jammu and Kashmir. The relationship was already defined by the instrument of accession. The proclamation by Yuvraj Karan Singh in November 1949 and more importantly by the Constitution of India. Fourth, there is a clear absence in the Constitution of Jammu and Kashmir of a reference to sovereignty. In contrast, 
the constitution of india emphasizes in its preamble that the people of india resolve to constitute themselves or to constitute india into a sovereign socialist secular democratic republic fifth that the state of jammu and kashmir became became an integral part of the union of india is evident from articles 1 and 370 of the indian constitution it is reiterated it is reiterated in section 3 of the constitution of jammu and kashmir which is unamendable sixth the preamble of the constitution of jammu and kashmir sections 3 5 and 147 of the state constitution coupled with article 1 of the constitution of india read with the first schedule as well as article 370 indicate in no uncertain terms that a system of subordination as constituted as understood by the definition of sovereignty exists by which the state is subordinate to the indian constitution first and only then to its own constitution seven all states in the country have legislative and executive power albeit to differing degrees the constitution accommodates concerns specific to a particular state by providing for arrangements which are specific to that state articles 371a to 371j are examples of special arrangements for different states this is a feature of asymmetric federalism like article 370 which became applicable to jammu and kashmir on the adoption of the constitution the state of jammu and kashmir does not have internal sovereignty which is distinguishable from the powers and privileges enjoyed by other states in the country and eighth the limited question before the constitution bench in its decision in premnath call was whether the monarch held plenary legislative powers after the constitution of india as it applied to jammu and kashmir was adopted in the state but before the constitution of jammu and kashmir was adopted a decision is an authority for the proposition which it decides the question whether the state of jammu and kashmir retained sovereignty upon integration with the dominion of india did not arise in that case the next issue which we have addressed is the challenge to constitutional order 273 co273 to answer this issue we had to decide on two issues one whether article 370 is a temporary provision and two the effect of the dissolution of the constituent assembly of jammu and kashmir on the scope of powers under clause 3 of article 370 we have held that article 370 is a temporary provision on a reading of the historical context in which it was included article 370 was introduced to serve two purposes first the transitional purpose to provide for an interim arrangement until the constituent assembly of the state was formed and could take a decision on the legislative competence of the union on matters other than the ones stipulated in the instrument of accession and ratify the constitution and second a temporary purpose an interim arrangement in view of the special circumstances because of the war conditions in the state c we have held that a textual reading of article 370 also indicates that it is a temporary provision for this purpose we have referred to the placement of the provision in part 21 of the constitution which deals with temporary and transitional provisions the marginal note to the provision which states temporary provisions in respect to the state of jammu and kashmir and a reading of articles 370 and 1 by which the state became an integral part of india upon the adoption of the constitution d on the second question of the effect of the dissolution of the constituent assembly of jammu and kashmir on the scope of powers under clause 3 of article 370 we have held that the power of the president of india under article 370 clause 3 to issue a notification declaring that article 370 ceases to exist ceases to exist subsists even after the dissolution of the constituent assembly of jammu and kashmir for the following reasons first the proviso to article 373 that is clause 3 encapsulates the process by which the indian states could ratify the constitution of india the ruler of each indian state had to issue a proclamation ratifying the constitution on the recommendation of the constituent assembly where such body existed 
In states where the Constituent Assembly was not convened by then, the ruler of the state had to issue a proclamation accepting the Constitution. When a Constituent Assembly was convened in those states, the Constituent Assembly could make a recommendation for the modification of the Constitution as it applied to the state, and such a recommendation would be earnestly considered, into inverted commas, earnestly considered by the Union. The words recommendation of the Constituent Assembly, referred to in Clause 2, shall be necessary before the President issues a notification, as it appears in the proviso to Article 370, Clause 3, and must be read in this context. Thus, the recommendation of the Constituent Assembly to begin with was not binding on the President. Second, at the time of the framing of the Constitution of India, it was obviously within the contemplation that the Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir was formed for framing the Constitution for the state. It was not intended to be a permanent body, but a body with a specific remit and purpose. The power conferred by the proviso to Article 370, Clause 3, was hence something which would operate in a period of transition when the Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir was formed and was in existence pending the drafting of the state constitution. Third, when the Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir ceased to exist, only one of the special circumstances for which the provision was introduced ceased. However, the other circumstances, that is the special circumstances because of the situation in the state of Jammu and Kashmir, for which Article 370 was introduced, subsisted even after, after the Constituent Assembly ceased to exist. This is recognized by the judgment of the Constitution Bench in Sampat Prakash. Fourth, the effect of the President declaring under Clause 3 of Article 370 that Article 370 ceases to exist is that the provisions of the Constitution which apply to every state in the first schedule would equally apply to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Articles 371D and 370 bracket 3 were introduced with the purpose of enhancing constitutional integration and not for the disintegration. So, the power under Article 371D and Article 370 Clause 3, even when exercised to its fullest extent, does not freeze the system of integration contemplated by Article 370, but is rather intended to enhance constitutional integration between the Union and the State of Jammu and Kashmir. Holding that the power under Article 370, Clause 3 cannot be exercised after the dissolution of the Constituent Assembly would lead to the freezing of the process of integration contrary to the purpose of introducing the provision. And five, if the contention of the petitioners on the interpretation of Article 370 vis-a-vis -vis the dissolution of the Constituent Assembly is accepted, then Article 370, Clause 3 would become redundant and would lose its temporary character. The President, while deciding if the power under Article 370, Clause 3 must be exercised, determines if the special circumstances which warranted a special solution in the form of Article 370 have ceased to exist. This is a policy decision which completely falls within the realm of the Executive. The Court cannot sit in appeal over the decision of the President of India on whether the special circumstances which led to the arrangement under Article 370 have ceased to exist. However, the decision is not beyond the scope of the judicial review. It is settled law that the exercise of executive power can be challenged on the ground of malafides. The slew of constitutional orders issued by the President under Article 371D, applying various provisions of the Constitution and applying provisions with modification, indicate that over the course of the last 70 years, the Union and the State have, through a collaborative exercise, constitutionally integrated the state of Jammu and Kashmir with the Union. This is not a case where only Articles 1 and Article 370 of the Constitution were applied to the state of Jammu and Kashmir and suddenly, after 70 years, the entire Constitution was being made applicable. The continuous exercise of power under Article 370, Clause 1, by the President, indicates that the gradual process of constitutional integration was ongoing. The declaration issued by the President in exercise of the power under Clause 3 of Article 370 is a culmination of the process of integration. Thus, we do not find that the President's exercise of power under Clause 3 of Article 370 was malafide. Having concluded that the power under Article 370 Clause 3 subsisted, 
even after the dissolution of the constituent assembly we have held that the exercise of power by the president to issue co273 is a valid exercise of constitutional power the next issue is the challenge to co272 on the ground that the power under article 371d cannot be issued to apply all the provisions of the constitution to the state of jammu and kashmir we have held that all provisions of the constitution can be applied to jammu and kashmir through the exercise of power under article 371d the power under article 371d can be used to apply one provision more than one provision an entire part of the constitution or all the provisions of the constitution that is the entire constitution the provision does not make a distinction between one or all provisions of the constitution non application of mine cannot be claimed merely because co272 applies all provisions of the constitution to jammu and kashmir in one go the next issue is the challenge to co272 on the ground that the president could not have secured the concurrence of the union government under the second proviso to article 371d we hold that the president seeking the concurrence of the union government instead of the government of the state to issue co272 is not invalid because first the effect of applying all the provisions of the constitution to the state of jammu and kashmir through the exercise of power under article 371d not on paint really